Zotero is um, a system for managing bibliographical data, sort of um, anything to do with books, citations um, that you find anywhere on the internet. Zotero um, works in sort of three ways. It allows you to grab those things directly from whatever internet source you found them on, so like a library catalog or something like that. It allows you to take all the bibliographical data down um, and to store it on a nice searchable database that's really easy to manipulate and find things in, um, and which is very easy to back up as well, which is handy. Um, so then it allows you to organize those cit citations and edit them and, and do various things with them. And then eventually it allows you to output them into your writing. So it connects with your word processor and when you're creating footnotes um, or bibliographies, it will import all the data that you've already got stored. Okay, so that's the kind of basics of what it's doing. So it's not a word processor, um, and it's not always not an alternative to a word processor, but it is a good place for keeping hold of information that's relevant to the research you're doing and coming back to it years later, in most cases, um, for me. So um, maybe the first thing to do is just show you literally what Zotero looks like. I have Zotero downloaded onto this computer now, and I'm using Firefox, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about browser choice um, later, but Firefox is really sort of built for Zotero. And, and you can see this small um, Z up in the top, top corner of my screen. This shows that Zotero is downloaded, and it's actually now sitting in my browser. Okay, so it's located right there in the browser. If I click on that, then it's going to open, here's one I made earlier, it's going to open um, my Zotero database for me. <coughs> so you can see this is now um, covering part of the browser. So I can continue to make searches up here or do whatever I like up here. Um, and at the same time, I can glance down to see if things are uploading into, into the library. So in my library, I then have all of these different entries. Um, and it's, it can be helpful to think of this a bit like an inbox. So I've found things on the internet, I've grabbed them into Zotero, and now there's a sort of individual entry for each one of those books that I found, in most cases books. So um, if we look at this entry, the second entry, um, it's a book called Chaucer by George Kane. It's published by Oxford University Press in 1984. So all of the bibliographical details are down here on the right hand side. Um, and the book itself and the kind of basic details are here. And I can also store this entry under various different sections, so if it's one of my primary texts, I could move it into a kind of primary text folder. Now the information in here, I haven't typed this in myself, I've actually downloaded it, grabbed it, Zotero likes to say, grabbed it from the internet. So all of you are familiar with the University Library Search page. If I have a look for the book um, Chaucer, <coughs> Then uh, here's the entry for the book, and you can see up in the browser again, on the top, I've got a small icon. Now this is the Zotero grab, basically, and this allows you to save information straight into your library. So by clicking on this small icon now, I could choose as many of these items from the page as I like. And when I click OK, it's going to save them down into my Zotero library immediately. If I just wanted the book by George Kane, I could choose it from that list. Or if I click through, so that I'm just on the Chaucer page, then you can see I've got a slightly different icon up here now. It's a blue book for a single entry. I can click on that, and that will also save down to my library. So now if I open that library back up again, then we're going to find multiple entries now for Chaucer by George Kane, yeah? So it's basically just grabbed hold of those, inf those bits of information. Here's another one a little bit lower down, uh, taken from the same screen. And it's put in all of the information that it can find about that book. It's now stored for me in this, in this database, okay? So that's the kind of basic grab. And that grab works um, for all kinds of different places. So it'll work um, on the, you know, the British Library website, on the university library, here in the faculty obviously. It'll work on the English short title catalogue. Um, it works in JSTOR. So um, I work on John Wesley, so I tend to make that my standard search, there we go. Um, okay, so if I want to download this very interesting article by Vicky Tolliburton, then if I click through on JSTOR, I'll see a different kind of icon, like a small uh, piece of paper. That's an article, so I can save that as well, straight into my library. The really neat thing about JSTOR as well is that this actually saves the PDF. 
Okay, so it won't just save the bibliographical detail, it will also try and grab down anything that it finds that is attached um, to that information. So when I open Zotero now, if I put Burton in here, <coughs> there's my book, and if I click here on the left hand side, it's also taken the PDF down offline for me. So that's now stored here in Zotero, okay, or on my computer. So I can now read that on the train on the way to the next conference or whatever I'm going to. Um, and it doesn't just store um, sort of academic stuff, it will store pretty much anything. So it'll, it'll take information from Amazon, for example, if you're just trying to store a book that you want to get hold of later. Um, from the BBC homepage, if you go to a news article, um, then all of those will be um, storable or any kind of newspaper, The Guardian, whatever. Um, and um, things like YouTube, it will take videos down, pretty much anything that it can recognise as a single kind of item, a library item, it will grab hold of um, and it will bring down any PDFs that it can find at the same time. Okay. There are times when we don't have the catalogue available to us for whatever reason, we're just working with the book in front of us. Well, that's okay as well. Um, so if you open up your Zotero library, you can manually enter something. So if I want to enter a new book, Shall I enter? I don't know. We'll invent the book. It'll be called John Wesley. All my books are called John Wesley. Okay, so there we go. I've now created an entry for this book, um, John Wesley, and I could fiddle with it, add an editor, add an author, and um, all those kind of things. So that's how we start to build up um, a database over time. And just to sort of put that in context of my own workflow, I tend to find you know, I arrive at the UL in the morning with great ideas about how many books I'm going to read in the day. So I get out my sort of 12 books and stack them on the, on the side, but then I'm only actually going to maybe read a couple of them, or maybe I'm just going to have a flip through and one of them's no good or whatever. So as soon as I've got them in front of me, I then go to the catalogue and I download all the bibliographical details. So at least I can re-find those books. If I walk away and they get moved, it's no big problem, okay? So I know what they are. And then as I'm reading through the books, um, if I decide that they're really good, I might file them in a certain section. Read later is one of my one of my own ones on my computer. Like read this, this is important, or this is good for my students, or whatever. So I file it as I go. And I also use Zotero for note making. So each one of these books also has a, a notes field here. So I can add notes as I go, and I find this extremely helpful. So as you're browsing and there's a really fantastic quote on whatever it is, you can write page 39, really fantastic quote about whatever it is fantastic, and that's now stored forever. So even if I close my whole library, go somewhere else, and then come back years later, realizing, oh, you know, I had that kind of interesting quote about hymns, and I can't remember where that was, but it was really fantastic. If I can remember that it was fantastic, then I can find it again immediately in the book. So this, I mean, this beats your research diary, you know, really hands down. You know that feeling where you're like, oh, I wrote it in red pen, and it was on the top left of the page, and you start flicking. <laughs> you know, over sort of four years worth of research, this is so much easier and so much quicker. It's a really nice way to store this information. Um, and you can sort of store anything in here as well. So um, at one point when I really wanted to sort of index my work and feel that I've really covered everything and find all the places where I'd mentioned various things across a whole range of documents, notes, documents, finished work, essays, I actually um, copy and pasted the text of them into notes fields for the relevant books. And then the, that essentially made my entire research completely searchable. So I could then go back and say, well, actually I wrote a conference paper on that, and I've got like a small section there, a couple of nuggets, which I want to now use. Um, because you tend to find, especially as the project grows, you know, maybe you did some work in your MPhil that was relevant, and you've got another bit there. And so it's a nice way to kind of bring everything together in the notes field there. So that's why I, that's why I use the notes for. Okay, so then the last sort of main um, function of Zotero then is to export this information into your documents um, as you're writing them. So um, here's good, this is going to be my essay on John Wesley. Um, so as I'm typing, I decide that I need to insert a footnote. So by adding Zotero into Word, um, I now get this custom toolbar here, which is a Zotero toolbar. Um, on my computer, I'm using a slightly different version of Word, and this is actually a kind of floating toolbar, which is, which is neat. 
um, but this is sort of fine as well. This is speaking all the time to my library. Yeah, so it's directly in contact with my Zotero library all the time. And by clicking here on this little button in the top left, it's then going to start setting up my document for footnotes. So I can choose a style guide. Um, obviously in this faculty, that's the MHRA, uh, but you could use, use anything you wanted, the Chicago, whatever it is. I decide that I want footnotes rather than endnotes. And it's now going to ask me, it's going to bring up this little toolbar, it's going to ask me what book I want to footnote. So it was that article by Toller Burton, for example. So this is just searching my library for me. I click, press enter, and it's now going to insert a footnote for me at the bottom with all of the relevant bibliographical data, which is already pre-formatted. Okay? This is now editable, so obviously you're going to want to add page references. If you're one of those people that likes to write like a little spiel, like, well, this is very well discussed in, then you can do that as well. You can add multiple references, so you can have as many books as you like in here as well. You can see that it's brought through here this DOI number. Now, I don't like to include that, um, and I don't think that the faculty's MHRA sort of version of Style Guide likes that either. So if I want to remove that kind of information, I do have to do a little bit of editing. So what I tend to do is, as I'm creating my library, I look down here in my um, sort of bibliographical data that it's brought down, and I remove fields that I think are a bit messy. And I might also make some corrections. So occasionally it might bring down um, an abstract which is not very helpful, or here, for example, it's given me um, a kind of comma between September 1 and 2001, and I might decide I don't want that kind of thing. So I sort of clean up as I go through. Um, sometimes it could be even worse. Sometimes if you've taken it off a website that's not a very good website, it might have brought down all kinds of random information, or it might not have capitalised in the way that you want it to. So you do have to kind of check up as you go through. This is one kind of note of caution for, for how to use the theory. So now having taken that DOI out, though, if I come back into my Word document, I can click refresh, hopefully it will refresh, and now down at the bottom you can see that it's removed that. Okay. So it's always in contact with your database. Any changes that you make on the database, as soon as you hit refresh on your Word document, it's going to update everything. So this is very helpful, and it's also very clever. So if I was to make two or three references to the same book, it would either ask me for a short title, or it would start giving me an ibid if they were close enough next to each other. And if I then inserted a new footnote in the middle, even if it wasn't a Zotero footnote, just a standard footnote with a kind of long spiel in it, then it would be clever enough to realise that that was in the way and it would change it back for a bit. Yeah. So it's kind of live, it's fine, and it, it, it sort of knows what it's doing. You get the occasional glitch. I had a problem with um, a multiple volume book which had different titles and editors for each volume and I ended up having to store them slightly strangely in my Zotero library in order to get it to come through. But I mean, that was sort of maybe an hour's work quite early on in the PhD when I realised I was going to be referencing this complete works often, which then saved me a whole load of work right at the end. So I think it's something that you kind of need to invest a bit of time in as you go along, but as long as you do that, it's so time-saving at the end that it's really, that's really worthwhile. And so then, as well as the footnotes, we can also create bibliographies into here. So I've only got one book in my work cited, but I can create a bibliography anyway. Um, if I click here on this little button at the top, <coughs> then it's now created my bibliography for me immediately. And this would be alphabetized and, and nicely formatted as well. Okay? So if there were 10 works cited, it would give me all 10. If I want to add things to this that I haven't cited, I can do that as well. So by editing the bibliography, using this little edit button up here, I can add in as many, it's going to be an interesting essay on Chaucer and John Wesley and Don <laughs> Dunstan. So, okay. so I can add as many of those in as I like, and then there we go, it's going to update my bibliography for me as we go. Okay. So um, in terms of my actual thesis, the end process of creating that bibliography was rapidly reduced. This was really important for me. I really, really had to finish my thesis. I was expecting a baby in like two months. Um, so to have actually gone through and put this together and um, from scratch, written out from scratch, I think would have taken me a very long time. It actually took me probably about three weeks to check the entire thesis and create all of this stuff in one go. Um, and I think that it could probably have taken me three months if I if I hadn't been keeping good notes as I went through. 
this all has to be checked, right? It doesn't stop you from having to check it. You can see it's brought through like a date of birth for Susanna Fain. And so, I mean, it, it's not a total cop out in terms of your work processes. You do need to go back and look at it. Um, but it gives you a template to work from, you know, and, and that's just so helpful. And it means as well that you can identify where there are funny little glitches. Perhaps you've brought down two or three versions of the same book and they're from different editions. It's quite easy to identify that sort of thing in your database. It will sort of, it'll help you to, when you search for things, if multiple entries come up, you can say, oh, there's a problem here, you know. Whereas again, if you're working from multiple different documents, diaries, scraps of paper, backs of napkins, it's really hard to keep on top of that kind of thing, um, which was essentially my work process before the MPhil, I guess. Um, and I think it's something that you can fall into doing quite quickly as well, you know, just scribbling something down and never really taking good care of where your, where your notes were kept and um, how you come back to them. So that's the kind of basics of um, what Zotero um, does for you. There are a few other things that you might want to think about in terms of how you use Zotero. You can store other documents in here. So if you have a whole load of PDFs, maybe images, um, by the way, it's compatible with things like Echo, if you use Echo or Evo, um, it will bring down um, PDFs from that as well, which is really good. But yeah, if you have other documents, maybe things that you've downloaded in the past, you can create an entry and you can store those in here. And um, normally on my computer now, it gives me an option to save to Zotero. So if I bring something down from an email, say somebody sent me some reading for a, for a seminar or something, it will actually give me the option immediately to store that into Zotero, which is very helpful. Um, so that's, I mean, I, think I find that very useful for just keeping, again, keeping hold of things, not having scraps of paper here and there. It's really good for organizing um, bits and bobs on the left-hand side. So in my own one, in my own Zotero library, I have um, works that I've cited in the thesis as one section, and I have like extra works that are related to my thesis research. I have like new works that are related to a certain paper that I'm writing, and I keep them like that as I go. And I also have um, teaching. So if you've started, are you guys second, third years? Yeah. So if you're teaching, you know that situation where you're in the supervision and you think, oh, I should recommend this book to the to the student, but you're like, oh yeah, it's by. Collins or Collins and I can't really remember and it's purple and you know this kind of information is not very helpful to the student but if you've got your computer in front of you you can immediately find perfect bibliographical information exactly what they need um, and also you can create bibliographies sort of in a kind of offhand way so um, here presumably I'm going to be teaching a class on sermons so if I want to recommend all of these books to my student I can create a bibliography by right-clicking, create, create a bibliography from items there, and it will allow me to um, copy that to the clipboard. So I can then paste it straight into the text of an email, for example, and it will send a beautifully formatted bibliography directly to the student. I think that's very helpful and it's very professional as well. Um, you can share libraries between you and your supervisor or between you and your supervisees if you want to, and then both of you could um, upload things as you find them, upload notes and, and share in that way as well. So that's, I think that's very helpful. Another thing that I found useful post-PhD, um, which also makes me very glad um, that I worked on Zotero all the way through the actual thesis, is, is that you can change style guides very quickly and easily. So, I've written my thesis, it's in MHRA. I now want to turn it into a book and I need to have a chapter sample. But that chapter sample needs to be in Harvard style. The thought of going back through my introductory chapter and trying to iron out all the references and change the style of them, just I don't think I would even start. You know, it would absolutely kill you at that moment where you finish the thesis, you know. But in this, you can just change straight away. So um, by clicking up here, you can edit your document preferences. So if I wanted to change it to Chicago there, and I also want it to be EndNotes, I could just click OK. <coughs> and then down here, it's changed to the short form of the, uh, of the citation, you can see. And you can see it's an EndNote, so it's going to build as we go through the document. So it means you can just immediately update it. It makes the whole process so much easier, you know. You're not sort of stuck with a document that you can't easily edit. Um, so that's, I find that very helpful. And just thinking about um, keeping your documents sort of looking nice and professional as well. You know, sometimes you might be working on a conference paper and you're editing it right up until, you know, the hour before you're supposed to be giving the paper or something. You're still making little changes and, and making little snippets here and there. When you're using Zotero, you've always got access to everything. So you don't end up adding a footnote which is 
a rubbish footnote, you know, that says, oh yeah, it's this brown book and it's page 23 or something, you actually immediately have a way to make your document look professional. And it means that it's so much easier to share your work then. So if somebody says to you, oh, I was really interested in what you had to say about this, could you give me the reference? You've immediately got it looking, looking good, looking professional. It'll only take you a few minutes to create something that's really nice. Whereas if you're working, again, from notes, from research diaries, it could take quite a long time to gather together the bibliographical data that you need and get it in a good kind of form where you want to share it. So it just keeps, it feels like it keeps you at a nice level where even your working documents look presentable, they're shareable, you can give them to your supervisor and you don't have to feel like your, I don't know, that your process is kind of messy and that's not something that you want to make public, you know, you're always sort of there. And it's the same with teaching as well, you know, you can create a kind of um, very quickly this week, for example, I had to come up with my plan for next term's teaching for 18th century, and you can just very quickly come up with some suggested reading for the holidays. It looks really clean, really nice, um, and it's got all the different information that the students need there. So I think that's also a really kind of helpful thing that Satira does for you. Okay, we're nearly there. Um, I was just going to have a kind of note about browsers. Um, Satira is um, free. And it's downloadable here at this webpage, satiro.org. It's a kind of work in progress, so you really have a sense that the updates are being managed by a kind of group of kind volunteers in the background. Um, so there are frequent updates, and often you'll find that there's a little bit of a glitch. So um, we had somebody recently who was, came to the class, and she was working in German on a German browser, and she was having all kinds of trouble. We managed to find that there was actually an update to deal with that problem. Somebody had said, oh, I've got a bug, and they like fixed it. Um, so it's worth kind of keeping an eye on what's out there. When you connect Zotero to the internet, which um, you can set it up to do automatically so that it backs everything up for you, which I would really recommend doing, um, it will automatically do that for you. But if you decide not to connect one of your devices to the internet, then um, you know, keep an eye on what's out there. And Zotero was sort of built with Firefox in mind. Um, so it works very, very well with Firefox. It sits here nicely in the top of the browser. There's hardly any glitches. It's really easy to use. The grab symbols always seem to come up where they're supposed to. Um, and th and I, for that reason, I actually switched all of my research work to Firefox. So even though generally I'm more of a Chrome person, I don't really know what that means, but you know, I, I guess my social internet life or something is managed on Chrome. So that's where I have Facebook, and that's where I have all of my distracting links and the BBC website and whatever else I spend my time procrastinating on. When I'm working, I close down Chrome and I deliberately open Firefox because it's communicating with my Word document, right? So for me, that's also a kind of way of managing my research time effectively so that in Firefox, I don't have lots of little blinking lights shouting at me that I should check the latest Reddit or whatever, you know? Instead, I can just see my work, my previous searches, my saved sites, which are actually helpful to me. Um, if, on the other hand, you're using a Mac or, um, for some reason, you don't want to use Firefox, the standalone version of Zotero is really nice, um, but it doesn't sit in the browser quite like this. You'll still have an icon, but the library is stored separately. So you need to open the library as a separate page, and then you'll also open the browser and, and work from the browser. So it's just a little bit different. Um, and there are the occasional glitches then when it comes through to Word. It's normally for something really specialist, so if you're doing something quite unusual, then you might just need to really double check that it's bringing through the information that you want it to, or um, that it's updating properly when you press refresh. Um, and I think we generally say, like, if you notice that there are problems, um, obviously come and see somebody in the library and they might be able to help you out. But also you can report back within Zotero, there's a kind of forum, and if you post your problem within, a, you know, even a couple of hours sometimes, somebody will come and, come and help you out. Um, and I've actually, I wrote my own style guide, and you know, I said I had this kind of problem with um, the primary text that I was using. I found that the MHRA style guide wasn't doing exactly what I wanted it to do. So I went online and worked out how to edit the style guide, and it's not very complicated, even though I don't know a great deal about um, computer programming or anything like that. So now my, my guide is like my own one. <laughs> it sits in the style repository, and I know that it's always giving me the data that I want, so I have to spend less time cleaning up as I go. Um, so it is possible to do that, and it's, it's really not, not very difficult. I think that might kind of be the overall gist of how things work. Um, so I guess, yeah, in summary, it's just it's a nice way to, to 
um, grab hold of information quickly, especially if you're short on time. You don't have time to kind of devote to writing down all of this bibliographical information. You don't know if you're going to come back to it later or whether it's going to prove useful or not. But you can just store it quickly and easily, and you can always come back to it at a later date and find it more easily. It's good for organising it um, and to feel like everything's in one place, and also then to output that either in your work or as a bibliography, which you can then share and you can feel kind of confident that your information is thorough and um, as accurate as it can be, really. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? <laughs> question? Good. I have yeah. a question, sorry. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you back up using this? Yeah, um, so there are two ways, really. One is that in the browser itself, or oh, just close it, in the browser itself, um, you can set your um, sync preferences, um, so it will ask you to create a Zotero um, login and then you can put your username and password, I'm not going to do it in this computer because I don't want this to eternally sync to my, uh, to my library, but anywhere that you put your username and password in then it will always be backing up into the kind of big Zotero cloud. So even if you've got multiple devices or you're using like a computer here, you can just log into your library there and set it to be updating automatically. So every change that you make will always um, always go up. And then that change as well, as soon as you come into any of your Word documents that are connected, as long as you click refresh, you'll be able to see the changes there as well. So you don't have to be on your own laptop? You don't have to be, no, no, you don't have to be on your own laptop. And it's also possible to access your library in the Zotero webpage, but the functionality isn't as nice. Um, you can see the library, but it's hard to add and manipulate things there. It's much easier if you've got Zotero actually downloaded onto the machine. But it is nice to see on the Zotero website that all your stuff is there, you know, sitting there. You're not going to, again, you know the research diary problem where you're like, oh, where did I leave diary number three? It's just, it's, it's a really frightening moment where you drop it in the puddle or something. And, you know, this, uh, this kind of gets around that. Um, and I think, like, I spent a lot of time kidding myself that I did know how to find things. You know, sort of kidding myself that I, I did have a system. And actually, I'm not sure that that system was really as watertight as I thought it was or hoped it was. And I spent a lot of time at the end of my Masters wishing that I'd been more meticulous early on. Um, and over the PhD, I mean, that's just so much more a huge project. Um, and because you're, um, because you're sharing it really out there in the real world with your external examiners, the last thing you want to feel is that you're missing something or that you know, you're misquoting or, it, yeah. So it really it gives you a kind of sense of security and backup that you've got a system in place and that in the long run it's gonna, it's gonna help you out. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I, I was also, and I think this is connected with it, but um, uh, how it works between being online and offline. So if you're not connected to the internet, but you're updating the library. Yeah, so that's absolutely fine. You have to open the browser, but it doesn't have to be connected to the internet. So you won't, obviously, you won't be able to grab information down unless you're connected to the internet, but it will happily talk to your word. Yeah. So as long as you've got the browser open and you've got your word processor open, the two communicate offline or online. Um, and the next time it connects to the internet, it will just back again, it'll back everything up. It's maybe worth m mentioning as well that it's possible to um, de-link the document from the library. So it's possible to create like a kind of standstill moment in time, say when you decide that you're going to send it off as a journal article or something. You can then de-link the codes from your library and send that off as a kind of separate document. Um, or make like little manual changes if you feel like you need to make manual changes or if there are like, kind of peculiar things that you want to do that don't fit nicely with the style of that, you can still make those changes by sort of de-linking it from Zotero. Um, and what I tend to do that is save a copy, which I call a sort of de-linked copy, um, so that I know that that's not updating um, as I'm going. Yeah. Um, for Mac, even if you have Firefox for Mac, do you still have to download the separate? Um, yeah, so it's the Zotero page is quite um, clear on which bits and bobs you need. So you can see that for Firefox, you need to download the separate plugin. So that would be even if you're using the Mac. Oh, so I can just do that on Mac? Yeah. Oh. Um, if, you've got, yeah if you've got Firefox installed on your Mac, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. If you want the standalone, um, then you have to then choose um, a browser mm -hmm. extension, but the Word plugin is already included then. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you can bring yourself to use Firefox, mm -hmm. I do think that it's very useful. Um, 
it just works so nicely and I do find it to be like a nice kind of work space, I guess, in comparison to my, my Chrome, which is my distraction side, really. <laughs> Well, this is probably a really ignorant question, but is it is it always okay to have two different browsers that, or do, do you try not to open them at the same time? If you're using yeah, you can, you can open them both at the same time. I think that's because I I used to have Internet Explorer and Firefox installed on my laptop, and someone once said that if, if I was if I was having problems with pages crashing on Internet Explorer, it might be something to do with might be something to do with Explorer active. being a bit of a pain. I've never had any. Um, trouble with that. I mean, one thing I would say is probably don't open a standalone and also have the Firefox one installed at the same time. I'm not exactly sure how well they're going to communicate with each other. Um, yeah, but otherwise it's, it's all seems fine. And like, so for example, I at one point <laughs> downloaded the entire library um, Zotero, which is enormous, because mm -hmm. so I was working on the reading lists, onto my laptop. It took a long time. And then got rid of it and put my own one back on there, and that was, you know, was, the process was absolutely fine. I didn't lose anything, or, you know, it seems to be quite stable. Um, and you've always got the back the sort of benefit of knowing that it's backed up in the cloud as well. Yes. It's, it's free until you get to a certain point, and then that you probably shouldn't get beyond that. You have, you have no paid for. No, 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 no. I'm nowhere near the limit of how I've got a lot of references. I'm nowhere near the limit of where you would start paying. For Did you consider using other reference sites? Yeah, I did look at um, EndNote. My husband's a scientist, um, and he, I think, was kind of guided towards um, using EndNote. Um, I personally find that Zotero is a lot more kind of kind of sort of intuitive, basically. You know, you can just grab stuff, and for my reading process, it really matches. Like, I see something, I think it's really interesting. I do not have time to look at it right now, but I don't want to lose it. Um, so that's quite helpful, I think. Whereas EndNote, um, it feels like you really need to fill in all the fields and everything has to be kind of beautifully set up. You can't just sort of grab and move on. Um, but there are situations where I know that some people do use EndNote. So I've got a friend, Tony, who's working in the ASNET department um, and his project is really a bibliographical project. So these details are very, very important and he wants absolutely maximum amounts of detail. And I know that he uses um, EndNote and I think he wrote his own style guide for EndNote as well. Um, so, I mean, it might be worth having a look if you're not kind of convinced that Zotero is working for you to see what else is out there. But I think that Zotero is really great for a literature project. And although actually Tony said to me that actually he, if he was starting now, he would look at Zotero again. Yeah, this because is another change thing. such a yeah. lot in the last four or five years. But yeah, Zotero was so, um, it was really buggy in the first year. And actually I started using it and then stopped and thought never again. Um, but then I did come back to it. Now it's much, much smoother. And I mean, it's got all the extensions and everything. And it's really, it's very nice. I mean, I, I've rarely had any problems with it. Um, I mean, the entire faculty reading list for undergraduates is managed through Zotero now. That does crash. It does, it does <laughs> crash, but nothing has not. to do with the computer than, <laughs> than, with, the, than with Zotero exactly. itself. You know, it's been really good. Um, and the fact that it's compatible with so many things, like it's compatible with like ethos and ProQuest and anywhere that you might be going to find research. Um, I use Echo all the time and it's just a very helpful way to kind of keep hold of those endless titles, you know, the 18th century titles that go on with paragraphs, brings it all down for you. So you spend and time. actually, even if you're on databases like, I've noticed um, some like MLA, um, bibliography or Lion, for example, mm. if it doesn't say, um, that you can download to Zotero. Actually, you just need to click on this. It's something that says you can download to ProSite, um, Reference Manager, or something like that. You just click on it, and automatically up the Zotero to, to um, download thing comes yeah. up as well. So often in the places well. where it says, like, view citation, if you click through there, it will often give you the option. So even if it's not sort of beautifully fixed into the yeah. website itself, it often gives you an option. And I mean, it's just, um, it's as easy to type in the bibliographical information into Zotero as it is to write it down on your Word document that you keep all your references on anyway. So, I mean, it's, even if you can't find the details, it's still, it doesn't slow you down. It's quite good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, we normally have like a bit of a trial session if you, if you feel like you've got time and want to have a bit of a go, um, just to download it and check that everything's more or less working. Um, it's really worth an investment of your time. I think it's you know it's really worth half a day to feel like you know how to use it. Um, 
and in the long run you will save yourself time by, by doing that. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>